I'm so glad to see all of you here. You could have be down the street watching the closing ceremony, but you chose to be here. And every time that we're in the house of the Lord, great things happen. Amen? All right. Um, if you're new to IES, we're, um, you're wondering what that background is, that's waves. Um, because that's the background for Daring Faith. So we're in the middle of a series called Daring Faith by Rick Warren. And today's topic is daring to commit. Daring to commit. See, when, you know, when somebody dares you, like, I dare you to do this, it never, it's not a really good thing, right? It's like they're daring you to do something crazy, something that you're not supposed to. I think I remember my neighbor was like, I dare you to jump off the roof. You know, I was like, what? I could do it, you know, and I jump off the roof. So usually, it's not that high, but still. Usually when somebody dares you, it's not a good thing. But this is an awesome thing. God is daring us to increase our faith, to experience miracle. God is daring us to give our best to him, and then he gives his best to us. And so when God dares us to commit, you better know that on his end, he's ready to commit to us. Actually, he's already committed to us. He's waiting to bless us with so much blessing, we just need to commit to living his ways. So it's really exciting, daring to commit. And Rick Warren says that our life is shaped by our commitments. We become whatever we are committed to. And if we're committed to nothing, we become nothing. I don't know about you, but there's a period of my time where I was really good at this. I committed to doing nothing. Wake up whenever, play video games, and then go to sleep again, <laughs> play video games again, and just hang out and just do absolutely nothing. I mean, you have to be committed to do nothing. And it actually, like, you know, there was, it, it actually lasted a long time. So we're com we are shaped by our commitments. See, nobody becomes great. Everybody wants to be great, but nobody becomes great and significant by accident. Great people are just ordinary people who've made great commitments to a cause greater than themselves. See, we're all, all of us, we're committed to something or someone, whether we know it or not. Some people are committed to living out their principles. Some committed, yes, front row people. Yes. That's where all the blessings is in the front row. All right. So we're all committed to something or someone, right? We're either committed to living a healthy lifestyle. I know Reina is always, he's like, have you eaten today? He says, I drink juice. It's like, oh, it's like 4 o'clock. You've only had juice. We're all committed to something or pursuing our dream or, or something. We're committed by um, something in our lives, right? Um, I lost my place now. Oh, yes. But some of us, we're, we're afraid to make a commitment, right? Why are we afraid? Maybe because there's something better out there. Perhaps it's not worth the commitment. Um, I had some friends back in the days, not here, because you guys are perfect friends here. You're right. But no, you guys are friends. Um, but they always ask me, hey, what are you doing this weekend? Or what's, what's the plan this weekend? I would tell them, you know, long oh, we're going to do this. We're going to carpool here. It's like, oh, are you in? And they're like, Oh, we'll see. You know, they ask you, like, all the details. And then it's like, okay, are you in this Saturday? It's like, I'll get back to you Friday. They're always, like, waiting to see if there's something else better that comes up, right? They're always, for some reason, they're, they're always looking for the better option. So they're not ready to commit. And I love this quote. It says, never make someone a priority when you're just an option to them. Ooh, I know, I know, right? The girl's like, that's right, that's right. <laughs> so sometimes, even though our lives are shaped by commitment, sometimes we're afraid to make a commitment. I love what Rick says here, but lack of commitment causes us to miss things in our life, the greatest things. You, can't, um, you cannot live a life without making some kind of commitments. You can't buy a house without committing, right? Um, I don't know what it is here, but in states it's like, 15 years, 20 years mortgage, or 30 years. You can't buy a house making, without making a commitment. You can't buy a car without making a commitment. You can't have a job. Um, praise the Lord, my wife just ac accepted a job offer after eight months. So, But they're like, if you have to sign today, if you don't sign today, we're going to go to the next candidate. So she had to make a commitment to get the job. 
So all of us, we have to make some kind of a commitment. You can't get married by without making a commitment. Amen? See, we learned that from Beyonce, right? Put a ring on it. Yeah. Well, my finger got too fat, so I can't wear the ring anymore. True story. But it's still there. It's in the drawer. See, our commitment defines our life. The key is to make good ones, to make fewer bad commitments, and to make good ones. We're all committed to something. We're all committed to someone. And today we're being challenged to dare to commit to God. We're dare to give completely to God, not some parts of our life, but completely. Commit to living not only for our own interests, but to live according to what God has commanded and commissioned us to do, which is the great commandment and great commission. Matthew 26, verse 37, 39 says this, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is, is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, that is, unselfishly seek the best or higher good for others. Wow, that's, that's not easy, right? Secondly, Matthew, uh, in, a, in a message, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Help people to learn of me, to believe in me and obey my words, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And I'm with you always. We, we commit to doing this, and God is already committed to us. He's going to remain with us regardless of our circumstance and every occasion, even to the end of age. So I believe the highest form of commitment that we can make in our lives is to give ourselves completely to God and to give Him our best. Actually, when we give God our best, we're the one who is actually benefiting. Right? If we think about it, we give God our best, our best of everything, we're the one who actually benefits from it. Not God. Romans 6.13, which is our key verse today, says, Give yourselves completely to God, every part of you. For you have been brought back to life, and you want to be tools in the hands of God, used for His good purposes. So God created us for a purpose. Romans 12 verse 1 says, Since God has shown us a great mercy, offer your life as a, sick, a living sacrifice. Your offering must be only for God and pleasing to Him. Our offering must only be for God and be pleasing to Him, which is a spiritual way for you to worship. So the question we ask ourselves today is how do we give ourselves completely to God? Is it possible? I believe when we commit to getting to know Him, when we commit to loving Him, growing in Him, serving Him, and sharing Him to others, that's how we give ourselves completely to God. And while we do that, while in the process, God will reveal His purpose, His plan for our life, and use us in miraculous ways to make an internal impact and difference. Before we continue, let's pray. Father God, we want to live meaningful lives, a life full of purpose. We want to make an internal, eternal impact and difference. Would you help us to give our best to you? Help us to give ourselves completely to you. Would you speak our hearts today and reveal your truth for our lives? Help us to see that living for your purpose far exceeds any plans or goals we can have for ourselves. Help us to see that we can live our best lives by having daring faith, by believing that you could provide, by believing in your promises. Would you open our eyes this evening as we go into your word? May the words of your servants be guided by the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, Son, we pray, and the Spirit. Amen. Come on in. Plenty of seats. So, for us to give ourselves completely to God, we need to get to know Him better. We need to strengthen our faith. So, number one, to strengthen our faith, how do we do that? We must commit to unite with others in worship. Okay. Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up like, with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. See, when we worship together, it renews our strength. There's many times, um, wasn't the worship great today? Yeah. 
Not because they're great, because our God is great. And whenever we come and we focus on Him, there's something that happens when we worship together that God somehow does something within our hearts. And sometimes you go to a service and you just walk in and you know the presence of God is there already and God is touching everyone's heart. See, when that happens, your, your faith is renewed, your strength, your joy, you are overflowing with God's love. See, when we worship together, it renews our strength. Psalms 100 verse 2 says, Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him singing with joy. For me personally, when I worship together, it, it helps me to hear from God. Many times in this place, when Abby and I were in the brink of like making big decisions of our lives, what we should do, when we worship together, somehow with everyone worshiping and it's, it's noisy, there's you know the bands playing, everything, but somehow in the midst of that, it becomes so clear that God speaks to me. So that's why I love worshiping together. Um, when I first came back to the Lord, um, I was away from God, I don't know, a good eight, ten years back in the States. I remember I would just go on the website, where's the nearest church around my house? Sunday wasn't enough. I would go on a Wednesday or there's, you know, I would go to I live in San Gabriel Valley. And like I would drive half an hour, 40, 45 minutes just to go to different places because I want to hear from the Lord. And for me, worshiping together, that's how I hear from the Lord. Um, that's why we need to be excited when we get together. When we worship the Lord, we need to have this excitement because you never know when you worship God and we're together that God has that word for you and it just sets you free. Amen? All right. And that's why we have worship nights. How many of you guys haven't been to our worship night? Raise your hand. Haven't been. Belum pernah. Not yet. Okay, we're going to have one soon. Okay, so stay tuned. Okay. We need to get our worship on all the time. Okay? When we completely give ourselves to God, it enables us to know our identity and our purpose in life. So therefore, if we want to discover what our identity and our, and our purpose, we must commit to connecting with others for fellowship. So it's good that we come and we worship together and God does something amazing before we leave this place, after we worship Him, we hear the word, we, we're just like renewed. But beyond that, we must commit to connect with others in fellowship. We need to connect with others um, to learn who we are. Um, let me start that over. We learn who we are in relationships. We learn our true identity, and, and it happens through community. You don't learn about who you are if you're just all by yourself, right? You need to be in a community. Romans 12, 4 verse 5 says, We are like various parts of human body. Each part gets its meaning from Christ's body as a whole, not the other way around. Each of us finds our meaning and function as part of his body. But as chopped off finger or cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? That's from the message. If you, yeah. So our body functions when each part is connected and working together. Doesn't make sense if my eye is on the floor, right? I detach. Like, I won't be able to see. If our, you know, the, the example that we have is if our hands are chopped off, it doesn't work out that way. We need to be connected to the body, which is God, which is Christ. See, when we're connected, each body has no purpose unless it's connected to the body. The purpose that God made you, made me, that purpose could only be discovered when we're connected to the body and the body of Christ. So it's all about relationships. See, everything could be going well in your life. You could have a great week. You know, everything is going well. But then if you have conflict, suddenly you have conflict, everything just starts to stink, right? Because we get our identity, we get our purpose, we get all these things from relationships. Therefore, when conflict occurs, it's not pleasant. It affects who we are. Anytime we have conflict in relationship, it affects who we are and what we are. That's why conflict is so painful and miserable. Romans 12, um, 12 verse 4 to 5. Hey, I think I just read that. Did I just read that? Yes, I did. Okay. So our job is to be peacemakers. We're supposed to be peacemakers. We're connected, and we're supposed to help each other um, to find out what our purpose is 
and that only happens in relationships. As our job as a follower of Christ, if we are followers of Christ, we need to be the peacemaker. We need to make relationship better to create peace and harmony and love as much as we can. Ephesians 2.16 says, Christ brought us together through his death on the cross. The cross got us to embrace, and that was the end of hostility. See, Paul is talking about this wall of separation between the Jews and the Greeks. So the background is that only Jews were allowed in the outer court of the temple. If you were any other race, you would get killed. But when Jesus came, he tore down that dividing wall between races, and he created something brand new, that every race is welcome into his family, into the church, all nation. And if you're new here at IES, that's one of our IES family values. We don't care where you're from, regardless if you're from states or the Philippines or if you've done something in the past. We don't care where you are from. We only care where you are going. And that's towards being more and more like Christ. Um, we have a motto here. It's the, it's the triple B or um, can we see the logo there? That's not Big Baller brand, but that is the Big Baller brand. But it's belong, belief, become. Okay? So we don't care where you're from. We only care where you're going. IES is not a country club. In a country club, you have to pay fees, Right? And then you have to act a certain way, wear certain clothes in order for you to be part of the club, right? And if you don't follow the rules of the club, you get kicked out of the club. We're not like that. We welcome everyone. Everyone has a place. Everyone can belong here at IES. We don't care where you've been. We only care where you're going. And when you are here, you have an opportunity to believe who God is, who Jesus is, who you are in God, in Christ. And then as you start to believe, as you start to hear his word, as you start to worship him, you'll become who God has called you to be. So it's not that you have to be a certain way first, and then you could belong to IES. That's not how it is. Everyone belongs here. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 19 says, Now God has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us ministry of reconciliation. Can everyone say ministry of reconciliation? Good job. And the message of reconciliation. One more. Message of reconciliation. Okay. So the ministry of reconciliation, basically peacemaker, right? Matthew 5 verse 9 says, You are blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. That's the ministry of of reconciliation. The Amplified says, Blessed, spiritually calm, with life, joy, and God's favor are the makers and maintainers of peace, for they will express his character and be called the sons of God. God has given us a responsibility to be ministers of reconciliation. And we also have the message of reconciliation, which is the gospel, the good news, that we could belong without having to become first, that we could have forgiveness in and through Jesus Christ. And not only that Jesus forgives us, but he redeems us. How many of you have done something in the past that you totally regret? Yeah, he redeems that, completely redeems that. So that's good news. And we could have life with meaning. There are no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Our sins are paid off. That's the good news. We have a message of reconciliation. And I always share this, I use this example that whenever you eat something and it's great or it looks good, you take a picture, boom, it goes on the Instagram, right? You want everyone to know, look at this um, fried rice. It's just, wow, it glistens. Okay, maybe not fried rice. Nobody takes a picture of fried rice. But if you like, you have this good dessert, right? You tell everyone, well, we have the message of reconciliation. We have the good news. We should always be excited to share that. When we completely give our lives to God, God begins to reveal His plan, His purposes, His gifts in our lives. We start to realize the potential that God has given within us. So we worship together, we connect in fellowship, then we start to develop our potential. And in order to do that, we must learn from others to grow. There are some things that you can't learn on your own. You can only learn them in relationship with other people, in community, in fellowship. 
That's why we have small groups. So if you're not in a small group, we encourage you to join one, do life together. You can't learn forgiveness by yourself, right? You just can't. Um, it has to be in a relationship. You can't learn loyalty without having a relationship. You can't learn love by yourself. You can't learn what kindness is without other people. You can't learn faithfulness. So love, kindness, sympathy, unselfishness, loyalty, forgiveness, graciousness, faithfulness requires other people. The most important things that we need to learn in life requires us to be in relationship with other people. We just can't do it on our own. To love God and love your neighbor requires other people to be your neighbor. So if I want to build my potential and the best version of God that created me, I need to learn from others to grow. And where's the best place for that? I believe here, in the family of God at church. Amen? Or in small groups, life groups, connect groups, or accountability groups. Um, see, I believe God has strategically put people in our lives for a reason. And I'll, I'll use some examples here. I remember when we started this service, it was early in the morning at 9.30, and we were on the eighth floor. And I think one of the first or second service, Jeff Hun came up to me, and he's just like, hey, there's this friend that he was in teens. His name is Anga. He's back, but he might be gone in six months. But if we could, like, you know, connect with him, it will be great, right? So right away, hi, I'm Anthony, blah, blah, blah. I, I think I gave him a croissant um, just to bribe him, you know? And it worked. Look, he's still here, right? Yeah. And I remember that, that first day when I met Anga, and then, um, yeah, our, just our relationships have grown. Now he's part of the core team here. Um, I remember the first time Raina, where's Raina? She's back there somewhere. Like, she came to, I think, I think it was the 1115 service, this girl with this long blonde hair, and I was like, I was, like, I was telling my wife, babe, that, that girl right there, we got we to gotta introduce ourselves. And we introduced ourselves. I remember Matthew, he's doing sound somewhere there in the back. Oh, there he is. We were having life group. See, before, we didn't have someone permanent doing the sound system in the back. We would try to hire someone, but then, like, it's always inconsistent and all that stuff because life happens. And, and we were literally, you guys remember this. We're in life group. We're like, we need someone who can do sound, who has education in sound. We need to pray. God, we need somebody. And all of a sudden, Matthew came to life group early. And he's like, hey, guys. And we're like, oh, hey. And then we found out he does sound, and he just graduated from Sound Academy. I was like, wow. So I believe God puts people in our lives for a reason, so we can learn from each other. Ephesians 4.16 says, Christ's body is fitted together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. We help each other grow. I help you grow you help me grow. The people sitting next to you, they will help you grow. You need them just as much as they need you. See, there are many things in life that we cannot learn unless we're in a relationship with other people. God, I believe God wired us in such a way that we need to be in fellowship, that we need to be in fellowship, in relationship. But I know relationships, friendships could be hard, could be difficult, could be messy, um, friends, and then there's our frenemies. I don't get frenemies, you know. Your friends, but then your enemies. I guess, like, keep your friends close, your enemies closer, so therefore frenemies. I don't know. Um, there's family members. How many of you guys have a complicated relationship with your family members? Yeah. Well, the rest of you are good. All right. Because your family is next to you, huh? No, uh, no. <laughs> Business partners, boyfriend, girlfriend, husbands, wives, siblings. You name it, all sorts of relationship, is, it's, it's, it could be complicated. Rick Warren has all these, he says, VIP people, very inspirational people. Everybody wants to be a VIP, like, oh, well, yeah, very inspirational. That's easy to get along with. And there's VDP. It's not a sexually transmitted disease, okay? It's VDP, he says, is very draining people, right? And then there's EGR, extra grace required people. Right? When you're there around you, you need to have extra grace. So in every relationship, 
we're in, I believe God can make all things work together for our good and his purposes. I love this example. I think it was Chuck Swindoll or Chuck Smith um, talking about, the, I've said this before, the codfish and the catfish. So a number of years back, the codfish industry on the northeast coast of the U.S. had a problem. Because when you have fresh fish, it's good, right? So how could they keep the codfish fresh while they transport from the east coast to west coast? When they froze the fish, they lost too much flavor. When they, they transport them life in tanks, they're filled with salt water. It got all soft and mushy. We don't like soft and mushy fish. Finally, they found a solution. They placed a catfish in the tank. See, catfish are naturally enemies of codfish. So the catfish would chase them around the tank the entire time that it's being transported. So now when the cod arrive, it's in better condition than ever. It's even more fresh because of the catfish. So what's, you know, there's always going to be a difficult situation, uncomfortable circumstance that is not pleasant for us to go through, but those things can help us grow as a person and shape us as a character. We need each other. We need everybody in our lives, and God can work all those things together. So if we want to grow, we must commit from learning from each other. See, when we completely give ourselves to God, we start to discover our potential, our purpose, our pathway. We start to experience significance. Okay? It's, oh, that's the rain. Okay. So significance, and what Rick Warren says here, it doesn't come from status. It doesn't come from your salary. It doesn't come your wealth or your stuff. He even says that it doesn't come from sex. Significance comes from service. See, God has wired us in such a way that we only feel significance in our lives when we give it away. You can't be selfish and significant at the same time. Significant comes when you stop thinking about yourself and you start thinking about other people and you give your life away for something bigger than yourself. Jesus says there's no, in, um, before I continue there, how many of you guys ever gone to a missions trip? Mission trip? I used to work at World Vision, um, and we used to go down to Tijuana, and we work with communities. And always, before you go to a mission trip, you think you're doing someone a favor, right? You think like, oh, I'm going there to help these people who are helpless. However, somehow, when you're actually doing it, and when you come back, you're the one who's been blessed. And that's, so that's what significance is, is that we're doing something beyond ourselves, and God has wired us that way. So when we start to develop our potential and we live for something greater than ourselves, we start to experience this significance in our lives. But Jesus also says that there is no insignificant ministry. We should never confuse prominence with significance when we start to do ministry. We can be famous, but not significant. We can be significant, but not famous. I believe every ministry and minister matters from the back to the front, from the camera people, from the one who's doing lyrics, everyone matters. And if we want, the aim is that we, we don't, we're not aiming to be significant, but, um, sorry, we're not aiming to have prominence. We're aiming to have significance, and we get that through service. Matthew 25, verse 40 says this, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of these least, you did for me. We do our ministry not for encounter, not for IES, not for one another. We do it for the Lord. That's why we give our best. So significance is being the best version that God has shaped us to be. 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each of you has received a gift to use to serve others. Did you know that each of you, if you're a follower of Christ, God has given you a gift? Each of us. And that gift is to use to serve others. Be good servants of God's various gifts of grace. The gift and talent we have are not just for ourselves. Our gifts and our talents are to be used to serve other people, to benefit others. Um, think of museums, right? If, if you're a great painter, other people can enjoy it when things are in museums. So that gift is not just meant for you. It's for others. Um, we also have this workshop called SHAPE here at IES, um, and we, we believe that this is a teaching from Rick Warren as well, that we are shaped for significance. So S stands for spiritual gift, H is for heart or passion, A is for abilities, we all have different kind of abilities, and P is personality, and E is experience. So we believe 
that God has shaped us. And when we find out all those things, we know like what our purpose is. And our, and our place and our function in the kingdom of God. And so if you want to know more about what that is, we're going to actually have that workshop on October 27th. So we do ministry. It's the path to find meaning in our lives. And we do service. When we, and when, as we do service, we experience significance. We're making an internal impact. Mark 8 verse 35 says, If you try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give your life for his sake, for my sake, for the sake of the good news, you will find true life. Isn't it interesting? As we give up our life for the sake of others, for a greater cause for God's kingdom, we actually find true life. See, we're not meant to serve God on our own by ourselves. We're meant to serve God with others on a team. And I, and I truly believe this. This is, this is my philosophy in ministries. We have teams I love putting together teams and recruiting, forming, norming, storming, performing, all that stuff. I actually just had a conversation with Harvey. I don't know where he's at today about this. So I love the team that we have, the Encounter team. You guys are great. So can we just give a round of applause for all the volunteers? <laughs> you want to experience significance? Serve in God's family. We're meant to serve together in small group in church. Um, and here's the plug, as Raina said, September is our missions, it, no, serve the city month, serve the city. And if you have any questions, we have brochures, talk to Katie. Um, we are dedicating September 15th, so if you want to know more information, talk to Katie, register online. Um, we're almost done. You guys good so far? Can I go on? Can I go on, Matt? All right, my man. All right, Ecclesiastes 4, 9, verse 12. It says, two people are always better than one because by working together, if one falls down, the other can help him up. But it is bad for the person who is alone and falls because no one is there to help. If two lie down together, they can share the same blanket and stay warm, but a person alone will not be warm. An enemy might defeat one person, but two people together can defend themselves and a rope that is woven of three braids is hard to break. It's talking about learning to work with one another, to work together. When we work together, when we learn to work together, we maximize our impact as first night. We just get more done together. Rick Warren says that what we do with other people in church is, will far outlast anything that we do on our own. What we do together will be much more significant than what we do individually. See, one person can't do much, but another person can't do much. But if we all join together, like in Surf the City in September coming up, we could impact a whole, like the city of Jakarta. So that's why we need to maximize our impact. Um, I love, you know, talking about teamwork. Like together we achieve more at Surf the City in September. If you don't have anything to do in September, serve the city. <laughs> Secondly, we maximize or we minimize our failures, verse 10. When we work together, when we serve together, when we minister together, we minimize our failure. It says that if one falls down, the other one just picks her up. But if you're alone, who will help you up? Um, we just had team nights. We do this almost um, every month. We try to. One of the things that we talked about is that in our team, we don't magnify each other's weaknesses. That's what teamwork is about. We don't magnify each other's weaknesses, but we instead we cover for each other and we push each other to do better. And thirdly, when we learn to work together, we pool our resources. And a rope that is woven on three bra uh, braids is hard to break. We experience significance in ministry when we work together in God's family in the church. So I want to challenge you, all of us, to commit serving in this house in IES at Encounter, to serve together, use your gifts, your talents, your passions, your ability, your personality for a greater good than yourself so we can make an inter eternal impact. Um, we have these volunteer cards. So if you want to volunteer here at 4 o'clock, you could fill one of these out and give it back to us, and we could get in touch with you. And lastly, we're talking about making an eternal difference. We must join with others on mission.
And what is that mission? I mentioned in the beginning, the Great Commission. To go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to do everything that God has commanded, and He will be with us. So our mission is to make disciples. Commit not to only being a disciple, but a disciple who make other disciples. I'll end with this. We begin by saying that our life is shaped by our commitments. We become whatever we're committed to, and if we're committed to nothing, we become absolutely nothing. So I want to dare you to commit to worshiping together. Come to church every single week. Go to a life group. Um, we have four services over the weekend. Like I said, you never know when you're at church, something good always happens because God is there. Be committed to being in a fellowship. And fellowship is beyond just getting together. That's just hanging out, right? Doing life together. And now what I like to say is you get to a point where you could stab each other in the front. Commit to serve at IES. Serve the city in September or volunteer's card. So I would like to ask the worship team to come up. When we are committed to giving ourselves completely to God and to others, new things start to happen in our lives. Things that you didn't think you were able to do, experiences that you've never thought you would experience in your life, when we're committed, when we give ourselves completely to God, those new things happen in our lives. Miraculous things start to occur in our lives. So we're going to sing one more song, and then we're going to close in prayer. To make me a vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing, but all you have given me, Jesus, bring you wine. I'm Let's sing this part again. Make me. Your vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing, but all you have given me, Jesus, bring you wine. Oh, this is our prayer, Lord. So make me your vessel. Make me an offering, make me whatever you want.
something new in our lives, to take us from victory to victory, from grace to grace, to experience new things. I think we're just living this much of the potential that God has given us. And He wants to begin something fresh, but we can't do that until we take a step of faith, until we commit to living the way He has created us to live, to be the person that He's created us to be. And I know that commitment is hard. But when God asks us to commit to living with others or being in fellowship, in relationship, and serving Him, He's not going to, He's not expecting you to do it on your own. He will empower you. He will enable you. But all you got to do is take that first step and say, God, I want to commit living my life the way you have asked me to. Let's pray. Father, would you please strengthen our faith? Lord, we want to discover our identity. We want to develop our potential. We want to experience significance in our lives. We want to make an eternal difference. Help us, Lord, to commit our lives wholly to you. Help us to commit worshiping together, to be in fellowship, doing life with one another. Help us, Lord, to serve together and to learn from each other. Help us to become what you want us to be. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may have a seat real quick. So I know I was kind of doing a lot of promotion for Serve the City in September, but it's it's one thing to, to hear the word of God and be like, oh, yes, amen, word, yeah, that word is good. Yes, I want to do that. But then if, if there's no action, nothing happens, right? Faith requires action. So that's why we dedicate certain times of the year for us to actually put our action into action, our faith into action. So I, I really urge you, if you've never joined, please do join. Talk to Katie. There's all sorts of information there in the back. So, um, yeah, let's put our faith into action and actually do something about it. I forgot to do the benediction, so can we stand up one more time and see the benediction? All right, let's pray. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace that surpasses all understanding. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Happy Sunday, everyone. See you next week. Bring some friends. When night has fallen, when fear is coming, Still you're calling